All right, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Tonight I want to talk to you about suffering, about suffering. And it almost sounds negative, but I think after our Bible study tonight, you will see uh, that it can be a positive thing. And uh, if you think about suffering, uh, I don't know anybody that has suffered any more while they were here on earth than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And uh, that's all through his life. Uh, you know, we go to the cross, which obviously was the worst part of it, uh, but, uh, you know, he uh, suffered through a lot of things. He had a lot of pain and a lot of sorrow in in his life. His uh, had burdens, you know, for people and burdens for even his own family. You know, his own family didn't even believe who he was, you know. So suffering is is something that every one of us go through. Uh, you can't dodge it. You can't act like it's not happening. And I think you'll see tonight, uh, you know, the positive ends of that. Let me give you the outline on suffering. Number one, creation groans. Creation groans. Romans chapter 8. We'll be starting in verse 19. Number two, believers groan. Okay, we groan. And when we say groan, it, it's hurting. Okay, it, it, it hurts. All right, number three, the Holy Spirit groans. Uh, and for us, you know, a lot of the things there is, is uh, physical groans, which, you know, we all have things that hurt us. We all have things that don't work as well as other things. And uh, we will be talking about that. And then the Holy Spirit groans. It's the spiritual side of things. And folks, I thank God that we have the Holy Spirit uh, with us. And we have the Holy Spirit that intercedes for us, and it's very, very encouraging. So let's look at this uh, tonight about suffering. Uh, creation groans. Uh, Romans 8, verse 19. The Bible says, For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. Okay? And again, we're talking about creation. You can go back to Genesis uh, that's where everything started. And let me, let me read another verse. For, for the creation was subject, subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. So, Verse 22, for we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pains together unto now. And folks, we know when God created the heavens and the earth, it was a perfect utopia, okay? There was no sin. Uh, everything that you saw uh, in the Garden of Eden was just an amazing thing. Look back in Genesis 1. Genesis 1, I want to look a just right back at the beginning, real quick. In Genesis 1, and you can, we can start in verse 29, but all, basically it says everything that God created, it was for mankind. But I want to zero in on uh, verse 31. Verse 31. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth uh, day. So everything that God created was good, and it was for uh, the good of man, all right? And then go to Genesis chapter 3, and folks, we know what happens in Genesis chapter 3. Uh, you know, there was the temptation uh, that Adam and Eve had. Uh, Satan was subtle, all right? He's sneaky, he's crafty, he lies, and uh, he basically tempted them, and Eve partake of the apple. She gave it uh, to Adam, and that's when everything changed. Everything changed when they did that, because there was only one rule. I mean, you think about it, living in a society or even a life where there's only one rule, you would think you could, you know, keep that rule, but folks, it's mankind. And here's the deal 
we have the freedom of choice. We are not puppets. God's not, we're not puppets. We can decide what we do, and obviously Adam and Eve did not make a good decision. Now look in chapter 3, verse 17. This is the result of the fall. Then Adam, he said, that's God's talking to Adam, because you have heeded the voice of your wife, and you have eaten from the tree in which I commanded you, uh, saying, you shall not eat of it. It was a direct disobedience of God. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it. In all the days of your life, both the thorns and the thistles, it shall bring forth to you, and you shall eat of the herb of the field. And in the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, which basically means death came in to creation. What went from a, a Garden of Eden to a perfect utopia, I'm telling you now when you look around, you can see the earth and creation groaning. Let me give you a couple of the groanings. Floods, earthquakes, fires, tornadoes, volcanoes, and droughts. All these things are a part of the fall. So we see here in the first part uh, of, of the creation groaning. Now look at verse 9. For the earnest expectation, or excuse me, 19, of creation uh, eagerly waits for the revealings of the sons of God. Folks, God has promised us that things are going to change. All right? He is going to come back because he's talking about the hope in the next verse, okay? The hope, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it into hope. We have hope in a coming Messiah. So we are going to see, and in, in, if you read in Revelation chapter 21, there will be a new earth, okay? There will be a perfect earth again during the millennium period, okay? It's going to be a perfect earth. Thing. And, and folks, that's what I'm saying. Even how you see, uh, you know, the coronavirus, now they're saying the, the new variances and all these things. Folks, I am telling you, God's going to wipe those things out. All right? Cancer. I, I just can't wait. I mean, I, I have known so many people, so many people in my family have died of cancer. And, and I'm just telling you, all that God is going to wipe out. And it says... Because, verse 21, because the creation itself will also be delivered from the bondage of corruption. And that's what he's saying, these birth pains, okay, these things that are going on, on the, you know, in the earth, they are going to stop. And he compares those to birth pains. And if you think about it, and we'll see that in the second part of, of that, believers groan, you think about ladies, and again, you know, God chose, ladies, for you to give birth, all right? And I'm glad God chose y'all for that, all right? Because I've been in there, I've seen what goes on, and I'm telling you, you ladies were in extreme pain. But I'm, I've seen it to where soon as the baby is born, everything, I mean, the pain, all that stops. Not that they're not without pain, but epidurals and all kinds of things help, but when they when you put that baby in your arms, the whole focus is not on your pain anymore. It's on that new life that you just produced. Okay, and that's, that's a picture of what's going to happen. Right now, I mean, you think of creation, and our, our earth is messed up. I mean, uh, you know, you can, you can just look at it and how we've taken down trees. How, and again, I'm, I'm not promoting something or anything. I'm simply saying all of that is going to change. Look at Romans 8, back in verse 12. Therefore, brethren, verse 12, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many uh, as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. And he's talking about us, folks. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you receive the spirit of adoption whom we cry out, Abba, Father. And again, it's talking about our relationship with God. It's going to be different, folks, than those who don't have a relationship with God. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit 
that we are the children of God. And if children, then there are heirs, and heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. And folks, I'm telling you, one day, one day, that hope is, is, is heaven, folks. That hope is, is being with God, his children, forever and ever. So we see right now, creation is groaning. And, and all these phenomena, uh, somebody just a few minutes ago told me there was, I think, I think it was Bill, told me that just today in the state of Oregon there were 39 uh, earthquakes you know, uh, you know, it, that would actually show up on, on the seismograph. And they said, I, I read a stat not too long ago that said there have been more earthquakes in the last 20 years in the world than all of history combined. What is that, folks? That's creation groaning. Okay, it's groaning. And so... It's, it's not going to get any better as far as the groaning part of it, but what we have to look forward to as children of God, folks, all that's going to change. I still have trouble in my mind fathoming what heaven's going to be like. It is going to be perfect. It is going to be a perfect place. Clear streams, uh, fruit trees. Uh, you, can, you can just read in Revelation uh, all that's going to, come or all that's going to happen so we see creation groans the second thing i want you to see is believers groan okay look at verse 23 not only that but we also who have the first fruits of the spirit even we ourselves groan within ourselves eagerly awaiting for the adoption of the redemption of our bodies i'm telling you i don't know uh when I get up, I'm getting to be like my good senior adult friends that I have. I, I first find out what's hurting and what's not hurting, okay? I talked to a lady this week in our church that said she has such a problem with a sciatic nerve that she literally crawls out of bed, literally gets in the floor, puts a ball under her legs, and somehow, you know, the... The rehab guy told her, if you will do this, you'll be able to get up and walk. And she has to do that for 8 to 10 minutes before she can even walk when she gets up. Now, folks, that's our bodies groaning, okay? Uh, Put up my Christmas lights. Next morning, guess what hurt? My feet. Why? Because I'm standing on a ladder, all right? Uh, You start walking. If you hadn't walked in a while and you start walking, What hurts? Really everything hurts on you if you hadn't stopped, okay? Our bodies groan, okay? Now, you young folks, all right, uh, you don't have to worry so much. You you get up and you just go, uh, Jacob and Lauren. You you know, you're not checking things yet, all right? But we have to do that in our bodies. Folks, I'm just telling you, the, the flip side of that, again, is our glorified bodies. Folks, we are going to get a glorified body, a perfect body. Look at verse 24. For we were saved in this hope, but hope uh, that is seen is not hope. For why does it, uh, for why does one still hope for what he sees? And folks, you think about all that people do to their bodies, okay? I mean, there's Botox, people spend hours in the gym, uh, vitamin regimens, all these things, and there's nothing wrong with taking care of your body. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm just telling you, folks, uh, uh, you know, uh, even even people that exercise uh, all the time, a lot of times uh, they, their knees are hurting or their feet hurt. Okay, even, in, and I'm all for exercise. I wish I was more disciplined in that area. But what he's saying here is that hope, that we see that's out there is that future glorified bodies. I've told you this before, and again, I have no scripture to back this up, but I just just feel like when we get to heaven, Jesus lived for 33 years. I I think we will go back because we have to be able to be identified by others. And I think when everybody, or at least when I was 33-year-old, I'm telling you, I was in my prime. I was still playing softball. 
I was still running. I was still doing all kinds of things. And then you take away anything that hurts on earth, okay? That means that new glorified body, folks, I'm telling you, it's not going to hurt a bit. It's going to be perfect, all right? I, you know, again, I don't think we're going to be sleeping in heaven, but if we were, I think we'd just jump out of bed and take off running, okay? Because nothing, we have that glorified bodies inside of us. Look at verse 25, but if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with uh, perseverance. And again, folks, uh, you know, we have, I, I guess the thing that the world does not understand, we have something that the, the world doesn't have, okay? And that hope is in Jesus Christ, okay? One of the worst answers I ever get when I ask a question, if you, to, if you were to die today, would you go to heaven? I hate this answer. I hope so. And, and my next thing is, you're telling me you are going to, uh, you know, weigh all of, all of your life and eternal life on I hope so? Folks, I'm telling you, I don't want to hope so. I want to know so. And we as Christians, we have that hope that other people do not have. And that hope, you know, when we think of creation, man, it's going to be a perfect environment. When we think of our own bodies, we're not going to be hurting, okay? And again, I don't know all of how, you know, we move about. You know, I've heard all kinds of things about we just think it and we can be in another part of heaven and all that. All I know is that, folks, it's going to be a perfect place. Uh, Philippians 3. Go to Philippians 3 with me. Philippians 3. Philippians 3, verse 20. Philippians 3, 20. For our citizenship is in heaven, from whom we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Folks, we're going to be like Jesus. I mean, that is a goal in my life. I want to be like Jesus. I really do, but I, I fall miserably short of that. But to know Jesus and to be like Jesus, 1 John basically says the very same thing. Then Philippians chapter 1, Philippians 1, just turn back a page, verse 19, Philippians 1, 19, for I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ according to my earnest expectations and hope that nothing in nothing I will be ashamed, but with all boldness as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. What is Paul saying? He really doesn't matter. My whole life as a Christian needs to be glorifying God. Okay, not me, not my body. And again, I think we should take care of our bodies. All right, but our whole good health is so you'll live longer, you can witness to more, and you can testify. You can testify. Now here, verse 21, for, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Folks, I want to live for Christ, but if I die, so be it. Okay, I'm better. I'm telling you, every one of our church members that have died this past year, they are a whole lot better off than we are. They are in a perfect place. And the Bible says, but if I live in the flesh, this will I mean fruit from my labor. Yet what shall I choose? I cannot tell. For I am hard pressed between the two, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. And you know what I'm finding out? The older I get, the more I think about heaven. The older I get. And folks, I'm just telling you, there are things worse than death. There are things. Folks, I, I just totally feel sorry for someone sitting in a nursing home and never able to get out of bed, never able to, to do anything. Okay, I, That just breaks my heart. I can't imagine being in a place like that. And then it says, verse 24, Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. So Paul is simply saying, man, I think about heaven a lot. 
I think about my new body. I'm thinking about the streets of God. I'm thinking about Jesus Christ. I'm thinking about talking to, and you just fill in the blanks there. But yet, the reason God leaves us here is that so we can witness to people and we can take some folks to heaven with us. So we see creation groans, believers groan. We hurt. We have pain. We are hurt. We are going to be hurt. All right? There's always going to be, you know, I'm, I mean, bad news. You know, and it's, it's how you, you know, you, you handle that bad news. Folks, there are a lot of things in life you can't change. You can't say, Okay, I mean, I mean, you can pray God don't give me cancer, but I'm just saying, you know, it's not that God gives it to you. It's what man has done. My belief in cancer is, I'm telling you, with all the pesticides and all the steroids and everything we are, are doing to food, I'm telling you, I think half of, of that's that part. So we see creation groans, believers groan, and the Holy Spirit groans. Look back in Romans chapter 8, verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses. Folks, I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit, it's, it's, it's such a good thing to have in, in a Christian's life. And you have to realize that there's never a time when you don't have the Holy Spirit. Okay? It's always with you. It's always with you. And, and we have weaknesses. We all have weaknesses. If you say you don't have one, you don't understand life. You don't understand. We all have weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray uh, for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us. Intercession for us. Folks, to me, if we are sincere in our prayers, all we have to do is start praying. And if we will start praying, the Holy Spirit takes over. But I'm telling you, even though it is a basic thing that we do as Christians, you know, we we sometimes, you know, we get busy with the day. Uh, we're tired when we come in. We find every reason in the world not to pray. And even when we don't feel like praying, folks, pray anyway. And if you get started in serious prayer, I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit will intercede on your behalf. Now look what it says. Uh, Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And those groanings are, are, are like, I compare them to our burdens. Okay, I don't know about you, but you know, there's been times in my life where I have been so burdened. I, I know there was a time for my sister, a Tony, uh, I mean, literally, I would ache, I would hurt when I prayed. And by the way, folks, praying is labor. Okay, if you really get into prayer, if you are really pouring your ha heart out to God, I am telling you, it is work, it is labor, and which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Folks, that's why we have to pray from the heart. You can't just memorize a prayer Okay, I love the Lord's Prayer. I can quote the Lord's Prayer. I understand the Lord's Prayer. But I need to go much deeper than that. You pray from the heart, and God will give you the words to say. That mind and that heart connect. And then the, the, the third part of that is the Holy Spirit. So I, I truly don't understand a Christian that says, I don't know how to pray. Folks, I truly believe if you'll just start, if you will set your mind to prayer, then you can pray and the Holy Spirit intercedes for you and literally tells you what to do. Not only does the Spirit tell you what to do, it tells you how to do it, how to pray and what to say. Why? Because I guarantee you, God the Father, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are one and the Holy Spirit knows God's will for your life. So if we have this partner in prayer, this Holy Spirit, so we, so we should know how to pray. Folks, there are certain prayers. I mean, you know, we are just, James says we're praying amiss. Why? Because we're praying for what we want. We want. 
And that's not how you get your prayers answered. Talked to a man earlier, I guess it was Monday, and he, and he literally told me, God let him down. I've been praying and praying and praying, and God let me down. And I took <laughs> probably 10 minutes to tell and show him and give him Scripture, and I said, God has never let you down. God never fails, folks. It's that we are praying, even though we, we can even say it, God's will be done. He knows our motives and he knows our heart. So the Spirit helps us even in that praying. And then we look at verse 28, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. Folks, even in suffering, God knows your suffering. God knows your hurting. God knows everything that you're going through. And you think about God himself, folks. God himself, he allowed Jesus to suffer. He allowed that to happen. Why? Because he had to go to the cross. He had to die. And folks, the key in praying is dying to self. It's dying to self, not your wish list. God's not Santa Claus up there. You know, he doesn't give us everything. I mean, even his parents, what if we gave our kids everything they ever wanted? They'd be spoiled rotten. And so we go through this suffering. Part of that is to prepare us to help others. And don't have time to go 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We go through these things so that we can help other people who are suffering in that area. All right? Then verse, verse 29. Look at verse 29. For he who foreknew, he also predestined to be, come, uh, to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. The question, why? Why? Why does God allow me to suffer? Two phrases, for our good and for our glory. For our good and for our glory. And the number three reason he does is to conform us to the image of his son. Folks, sometimes God has to break us. He has to break us to use us and for us to truly find God's will for our lives. Roman 8, 18. Go back to 18 just at the top of the page. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Folks, I am telling you, when you cross the threshold into heaven, I truly believe God will erase every negative thing that happened in your life. He will erase it. You will run into heaven and think it is worth it at all. All the pain, all the suffering that you went through, it will be gone, folks. It will be gone. And again, you will be like Jesus, folks. A pure mind. A pure heart. No more sin. Okay? No more pain. No more sorrow. Look at 1 Peter 4. 1 Peter 4. 1 Peter 4. Well, I know I've got it marked. Well, I guess I didn't mark it. Sorry. 1 Peter 4, verse 12. 1 Peter 4, 12. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is trying you. Okay, we all go through trials. We all go through challenges. Some, sometimes they're mental challenges. They're physical challenges the emotional challenges, as though something strange has happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you, you partake in Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceedingly joy. Think of the mo one of the most happiest days of your life. I'm telling you, it will not compare to the joy that you're going to have in heaven. It will not compare if you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. That's when someone says to you, how can you be so calm? How can you 
not be upset? How can you not blame somebody or blame God? How can you not be that? Folks, God, God takes care of us, all right? He's not putting us through anything his son did not go through. On their part, he is blaspheming, but on your part, he is glorifying. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or a busybody in other people's matters. That suffering sometimes is brought on by yourself in choices you make. Yet, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this manner. Then the last scripture, 2 Corinthians 4, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 16. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Folks, never give up, never throw in the towel, never say that God's mad at you, all right? Never say, you know, you know, you, it, it's okay if you're a Christian, it's okay. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Folks, why do you think God created rest? Why rest? Because every night we are supposed to get rest. And that rest, when we get up the next day, it's a new day. It's a new day. God erases. If you, if you confess your sins, He erases everything that happened yesterday. And today is a new day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment. Now this is Paul talking. We know what Paul went through. Okay, we know, and he called it a light affliction, but for a moment. And think about that, folks. Our 70 years or 75, some of you are even 80 years old. Compare that to eternity, it's just a blimp on the radar, folks. All right? A blimp on the radar. It's for the moment. It's working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Folks, the suffering gets us ready for the rejoicing. The re suffering does. While we do not look at things which are seen, and folks, we do that all the time. We look around and we compare, and it's what we can see. But folks, faith is the unseen. Faith is trusting God when things aren't going your way. Things is trusting God when, when and other people are throwing in the towel and giving up, and you being faithful, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Oh, folks, I'm just telling you, you know, nobody likes to suffer, but folks, it's a part of life. It's a part of life, and we need to understand that suffering prepares us, all right? For heaven, suffering helps us. Uh, uh, as a testimony that we can share with others what we have been through, a suffering is for a specific purpose in your life. Folks, God doesn't waste suffering. He is preparing you for a ministry. Father, thank you for this day. And God, I thank you that we have someone to emulate. We have a Lord and we have a Savior we have Jesus Christ who suffered. And God, I pray that we just we, we would not be mad at God. God, I know a lot of times situations come into our life and we don't understand it. But God, we don't have to understand it. Lord, we just have to accept it and we have to rise above it. We have to get, you know, when we get knocked down, we have to get up and just dust ourselves off. And God, you know, the next day is a new day. Next day is a day that we can, we can, you know, start over. So God, I pray that we realize that you have a purpose in suffering. And, and again, folks, uh, creation groans. I mean, uh, you know, there's so many things happening in our world. And we groan. We hurt. We physically hurt sometimes. We, we are emotionally hurt sometimes and it's just going to happen it's just imperfect people and God I pray that we would depend on the Holy Spirit to comfort us to encourage us to help us 
when we pray and to accept situations that we cannot change or even understand. And God, I pray that the end result is your glory, that people can see you in our suffering. And not that we can brag on what we have done or look what we have done, but God, I pray that we would brag on you. God, I thank you that we have that hope that others don't have. And God, I thank you that one day it's all going to happen, Lord. We are going to end suffering. You are going to end suffering for us. And God, we will live with you forever and ever. And God, thank you for that promise. In Jesus' name.